I want to talk today about one-dimensional head-on elastic collisions. That is, elastic collisions like this, where we have one object heading towards another, and there's a second one coming straight towards it. These two guys collide, and they're always moving along the line joining their centers. So it's a one-dimensional collision, and we're going to assume that the collision is elastic, which means that we have to conserve momentum, initial momentum equals final momentum, and at the same time, we also have to conserve kinetic energy. Whatever kinetic energy there was before the collision, it equals the kinetic energy after the collision. Now, there's several things that I want to do here. One is to find expressions for the final velocities. Find expressions for what I'll call V1F and V2F. What's happening to object one and object two after the collision? So I'll write down those results. I also want to give you and talk about a nice result that relates the relative speeds before and after the collision. And then we'll look at some cases. There are three interesting cases to talk about that will give us some insight into this kind of collision. And there are some demos. I'm going to link to some other videos that show a couple of nice demonstrations and illustrations of one-dimensional elastic collisions. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff to cover here. Let's start by writing down these conservation equations. Initial momentum equals final, and initial kinetic energy equals final. This object 1 has velocity v1 initial, and this one has v2 initial. So there's our initial velocities. The momentum before the collision is m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial. This is a velocity, and so is this. So the numbers that we substitute in could be either positive or negative to take into account the direction of this one-dimensional velocity. The momentum after the collision is m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. There's our statement of momentum conservation. Now let's write down conservation of kinetic energy. Half m1 v1 initial squared plus half m2 v2 initial squared equals half m1 v1 final squared plus half m2 v2 final squared. These two equations govern this collision conservation of momentum, and conservation of kinetic energy. If we assume that we know everything except what's happening after the collision, these two final velocities, then in theory the problem is solved. I have two equations for two unknowns. I can do the algebra, find these results, and the problem's done. So I'm going to write them down for you. The algebra is not interesting. We just solve these in whatever favorite way you have for solving two equations for two unknowns, and you write them down. The interesting thing here is to look at the applications, the demonstrations that I'll link in other videos, and to talk about this other result that relates the relative speeds. So let's do the thing that is not interesting first, and that is to do all the algebra that's required to solve for V1F and V2F. Now let's suppose that we just did that. Here's the result that you end up with. We get m1 minus m2, m1 plus m2, v1 initial, plus 2, m2, over m1 plus m2, v2 initial. All right, this is the final velocity of object 1 in terms of the two initial velocities and all the masses. Very similar thing if you solve for V2 final. You get this. All right. So this is the general result. If you have a one-dimensional elastic head-on collision and you know the initial velocities, you can use these two equations to find the final velocities. Let's spend some time, though, talking about something that's more interesting. 
I want to do a couple lines of algebra here to get us to a nice, useful, insightful result. So let's do some algebra on these two equations here. The first thing I want to do is to cancel all of these one-halves. If I look at this conservation of kinetic energy equation, I can just ditch those one-halves. Now, a couple lines of algebra. The first thing I want to do is to move everything to do with object one, this guy here, to the left side of these equations, and everything to do with object two, this guy, to the other side of the equations, to the right side. If I do that to the kinetic energy equation, look at what's going to happen. I'm going to have a term involving the difference of squares. There'll be a term involving v1 initial squared minus v1 final squared. And I can factor that. I can factor it into the sum and the difference. I get this. So here is the kinetic energy equation rewritten. v1 initial plus v1 final. v1 initial minus v1 final equals minus m2, factoring again, v2 initial plus v2 final, v2 initial minus v2 final. Okay, there's the kinetic energy equation. Ones to the left, twos to the right, and factoring. The momentum equation gives us a similar thing if we move ones to the left and twos to the right. We get this. We get m1, v1 initial minus v1 final equals minus m2, v2 initial minus v2 final. Now, why do we bother doing that? Because once we have moved ones to the left and twos to the right, if we divide these two equations, divide the left-hand sides and set it equal to the right-hand sides divided, something very nice happens which is that most of this thing cancels. The m1 cancels, the m2 and the minus sign cancels, and this subtraction term cancels, this difference term cancels. All of that goes away, and all we're left with is this equaling that. So let me write that over here, and we'll do one more line of algebra and have the result that we're after. Here's what we get. We get v1 initial plus v1 final equals v2 initial plus v2 final. All right, I'm going to erase this stuff over here that we don't need anymore. Our conservation equations and a line of algebra. So we can rewrite this one more time and see the result we need. Okay, the last step is to move the initial things to the left and the final things to the right. So this term goes over here, and that one goes over there. We end up with v1 initial minus v2 initial equals minus v1 final minus v2 final. Okay, that's what we get. Let's spend a few minutes talking about this equation and interpreting it. What is this thing on the left? This tells me velocity one initial minus velocity two initial. This is the velocity of object one relative to object two. Let's put some numbers in here so we can get a feel for this. Suppose V1 initial was three meters per second and V2 initial, the initial velocity of this guy was minus one meter per second. The minus tells me it's going in the opposite direction. This term on the left-hand side, then, would be 4 meters per second. 3 minus negative 1 meters per second. That's how fast these two guys are coming together before the collision. It's what I call the closing speed. This equation, then, tells me something really interesting. The closing speed equals minus the same thing for after the collision. Minus tells me it's in the opposite direction, and it's again the relative velocity. So this tells me that however fast two objects are coming together before the collision, they'll be separating, minus, opposite direction, at the same rate after the collision. A way to write this is like this. Let's get rid of the numbers. This you can think of as the closing speed. It's how fast two objects are coming together before the collision. 
This is the separating speed. Opposite direction means they're going to be separating after the collision. And it's the same relative term here, separating speed. A very nice result that is generally true for one-dimensional elastic collisions. However fast two things are coming together before a collision, they'll be leaving, they'll be separating at the same rate after the collision. Very useful. Now, I want to tuck this result away so that we'll have it in a few minutes when we need it again. So what I'm going to do is erase these basic conservation equations and shrink this and move it up here to the top. So let me shrink this guy and move it up here like that. All right. And now I want to look at these equations again and get some insight and practice using them. In particular, I want to take three cases that we can use to test our intuition and see how these equations get used. Let's look at them in turn. Here's case one. Case one is the easiest one for us to figure out what's gonna happen. It is the case where we have M1 much, much less than M2. So it's a case like this. Here's object one on the left, and it has very little mass. Think of it like a ping pong ball. And we're gonna make it move this way with some initial velocity. And it's gonna run into a bowling ball, something that's very massive, that's stationary. So V2 initial equals zero. And what I want to do is figure out what happens after the collision. I want to know what V1 final is and what V2 final is. We'll come up with this two ways. One using our intuition and one using these equations up here in the corner. All right, let's use our intuition first. If a ping pong ball runs into a stationary bowling ball. What's gonna be happening after the collision? Well, I think we know the bowling ball is not gonna do anything. The bowling ball is gonna to continue to just sit there. So V2F should be zero. Bowling ball is not moving either before or after the collision. Now what happens to the ping pong ball? Well, ping pong ball is gonna hit the bowling ball, it's gonna bounce off of it, and it's gonna come back just as fast in the opposite direction. So V1F should equal minus V1 initial. All that happens is its velocity vector turns around. It bounces off, comes back just as fast. And that's what these equations tell us. When we look at these numbers, first let's notice that V2I is zero. So both of these second terms are gone. We don't have to worry about those. Let's look at V1F. What's the ping pong ball doing afterwards? This numerator is approximately equal to minus M2. A tiny number minus a big number is approximately minus the big number. Divided by the sum, that's approximately positive M2. So this whole thing in front of the velocity is about equal to minus one to a good approximation. That tells me that V1F, the ping pong ball's velocity after the collision, is very close to minus the initial velocity. And down here, we have ping pong ball's mass divided by the sum, which is about the bowling ball's mass, and that's almost zero. The bowling ball's not moving after the collision. Okay, so that's the first case. Let me fill this in. V1 final is minus V1 initial. Let's look at the second case, which is going to reverse this. What's gonna happen here, instead of much less than, I'm gonna turn it around and make it much greater than. So instead of a ping pong ball bouncing off a bowling ball, case two is the opposite. It's a bowling ball bouncing off a ping pong ball. So we're gonna turn this whole business around and see what happens to the final velocities. We're now gonna have a stationary ping pong ball and we're gonna throw a bowling ball at it. So we have a bowling ball and it's gonna plow into this ping pong ball. And the question is, what happens after this collision? 
Let's use our intuition first, and then we'll check it with these equations. The first thing we can say is that this bowling ball, being very massive, is going to hit this ping pong ball and keep going, as if the ping pong ball wasn't even there. So we expect that V1 final should equal V1 initial. And in fact, that's the case. If we look up here at our equations, V2 initial is again 0. This is V2 initial here. The ping pong ball is at rest, so 0 and 0. These terms are gone. And the first terms now give us this. For V1 final, what's the bowling ball doing after the collision? Bowling ball's mass minus ping pong ball's mass. That's the bowling ball's mass, pretty much. Divided by, again, the bowling ball's mass. So this term is now 1, and the final velocity of the bowling ball equals 1 times the initial velocity of the bowling ball. That's this. Now the interesting thing is to think about what happens to the ping pong ball. What is the ping pong ball doing after this collision? That, I think, is harder for our intuition to sort out, but there are two ways we can get it. We can get it with this equation, and then we can get it with this closing speed equals separating speed. So we'll do that, and then I'm going to send you to a video to watch a demonstration. That's pretty fun. Now, what is V2 final? Well, let's see what we get from this equation here. The final velocity of the ping pong ball equals twice the mass of the bowling ball divided by the sum of the masses. That's pretty much the bowling ball's mass. So this whole term right here is very closely equal to 2. The final velocity of the ping pong ball is twice the bowling ball's initial velocity. So apparently what happens is when the bowling ball hits this guy right here and keeps moving at the same speed, this ping pong ball right here takes off and goes twice as fast. So the ping pong ball shoots out at twice the speed that the bowling ball was coming in at. Notice that is in agreement with our closing speed equals separating speed. Before the collision, these guys were closing. They were coming together at the initial velocity of the bowling ball. So V1 initial. That's how fast they were coming together. Now after the collision, the bowling ball keeps going at V1 initial. To separate from the bowling ball at that same closing speed, the ping pong ball has to take off twice as fast. Let's put some numbers. Suppose this is 3 meters per second. They were coming together at 3 meters per second. After the collision, the bowling ball keeps going at 3 meters per second. So to separate at that value of 3, the ping pong ball has to start going 6 meters per second. So he's running 6 meters per second. The bowling ball is still going at 3. Now they're separating at the difference, which is 3 meters per second. So this tells us that after the collision, the velocity of the second object, the ping pong ball, is twice V1 initial. Okay, that's pretty interesting. And it leads us into a nice demonstration. The demonstration is a basketball plowing into a tennis ball. A massive object plowing into a much less massive object. And the demonstration is what happens if you stack these guys on top of each other. Here's a basketball. Here's a tennis ball. All right. Now, if you drop these and let them bounce off the ground, something very interesting happens. If you drop them one at a time, they would each just bounce back up to where they started from. But if you drop them when they're stacked on top of each other, this tennis ball goes shooting up way into the air. And in a perfect limit, you can show that it goes about nine times as high as it was dropped from. There are two videos I'm going to link in the description. You should check them out. I really like the physics and the explanation given in the video by the physics girl. Okay, so there's our first demo. Let's look at the third case, and then we'll end with one other thing that I want to talk to you about. The third case is the equal mass case. So now we're going to replace these two objects and make their masses not different in some way, but we'll make them the same. The third case is m1 equals m2. 
So let's put a three here. And this is now like two balls on a pool table. And we want to know, again, what are the final velocities. So we'll get rid of all this. And let's look at the equal mass case. Here is one of them. Moving with velocity v1 initial, it's going to hit another one, same mass, which is at rest. v2 initial equals zero. Now what's happening after the collision? What's v1f and v2f? If you are a pool player, you probably know, if you take a perfect shot so that this collision happens in one dimension, it's a perfect head-on collision, and there's no spin, no anything else complicated, what happens is this guy comes in, it hits this one, it stops, and this one takes off and goes with that initial velocity. So V2 final equals, that should have been an initial, equals V2 initial. They trade velocities. This one stops, that one goes. That's, as it turns out, what happens. And we can see that in the equations up here. As before, these two terms are zero. Now what else happens? V1 final, the final velocity of the first object, the velocity after the collision, goes as the difference of the masses. So that's going to be zero if they have the same mass. So the first one stops. And the second one picks up a final velocity of twice the mass of one divided by the sum. They have the same mass. So this whole thing is just equal to one, and the final velocity of the second one equals the initial velocity of the first one. So V1 final equals zero, and V2 final equals V1 initial. They trade velocities. And that's actually true in general, even if the second one isn't at rest. If two objects collide and they have equal masses, they trade velocities. And that's because these terms go away, this one would go away, and this one would go away. And these terms would equal 1 if the masses are equal. So it tells me that V1 final is going to be V2 initial, and V2 final will be 1 times V1 initial. They trade velocities. That always happens if you have a one-dimensional collision between equal mass objects. They trade velocities, which is kind of cool. Another way to think about these equal mass collisions is it is as if one object is passing through the other one. Another way to visualize this is suppose mass 1 didn't stop and make the other one go. Suppose mass 1 just passed ghost-like through the second one. You would have the same situation. There's a really nice demo of that. It has to do with what's called Newton's Cradle which is a bunch of marble-like things that are hanging, and you can make them collide with each other. I'm going to link that video in the description. Check it out, and what you can see as you're watching all of these things that they're showing you is that in every case, it is as if the incoming object passed through all the other ones and just came out the other side. That's another way to think of the solution for these one-dimensional elastic collisions between equal mass objects. Okay, so the demonstration of the Newton's Cradle is a good one. It's linked below. Go check that out also. Last thing I want to show you before we leave is one more example back from case number two that we can use closing speed equals separating speed on. So let me just remind you what case two was. It was a very massive object and a very light object that we're going to collide. Now the collision that I want this time is a gravitational collision. Let's assume that this is a planet, Jupiter or Mars or whatever, and this is a very light object like a satellite. I'm going to call this one S for satellite. And I want these guys to collide elastically. What's going to happen is this thing is coming in this way with velocity of the satellite initial. It's going to collide and slingshot around this planet. So we're going to model the gravitational slingshot as an elastic collision in one dimension. So here's what happens. 
Let's assume that the planet is going this way. Velocity of the planet initial. We're going to assume that the satellite passes behind the planet and comes back out, being slingshot in the process. So what happens is this guy comes in, it passes behind the planet, and it gets pulled back out, and it goes this way. And it has some final velocity that we would like to know. What is the final velocity of the satellite? The way we're going to find this is by using closing speed equals separating speed. And the assumption we're going to make is that this planet is so big that it keeps doing what it was doing regardless of what's happening to the satellite. So the planet's final velocity is going to equal its initial velocity. It's so big, it has so much mass that the satellite slingshotting around it doesn't change it in any measurable or perceptible way. All right, now, what can we do to find the final velocity of the satellite? Let's write down this expression, closing speed, equals separating speed, and solve for the satellite's final velocity. The closing speed is how fast they're coming together before the collision. They're moving towards each other. So the closing speed is the initial velocity of the satellite plus the initial velocity of the planet. The separating speed is what's happening after the collision. They must be separating at that same rate. Well, now they're going in the same direction. So the rate at which the satellite is separating from the planet, the rate at which it's outrunning the planet, is the final velocity of the satellite minus, because it's having to run away, the final velocity of the planet, which is the same as its initial velocity. Let's solve this for the final velocity of the satellite. And what you find is that the satellite's final velocity is its initial velocity plus twice the planet's initial velocity. We'll put that down here. And this is the gravitational slingshot maneuver. If you want to take a satellite and make it move faster, what you do is that you slingshot around a planet that's moving in the direction you want to end up going. And you pick up some of its velocity. In effect, you take a very little amount of kinetic energy from this guy, an almost imperceptible amount, from this very massive object and you dump it into a object with very low mass and it increases its velocity by a significant amount. So the speed goes from some initial value to that value plus twice the planet's speed. And this is what's called the gravitational slingshot. An interesting application in part because it shows us that collisions between objects don't have to be hard body collisions. It doesn't have to be one thing bouncing off of another. It can be a collision where objects pass around each other. They interact by the gravitational force. That's the force that's dominating the motion. So it's still a collision, even though the objects don't actually touch each other. And it's a nice application to kind of a famous maneuver in space if you want to give energy to a satellite, you can slingshot it around something that's moving in the direction that you want to go. All right, that's elastic collisions. We'll look at a couple of more examples and problems. So I'll see you over there in a minute.